On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Beloved, I certainly hope you are still standing on the rock that is Jesus Christ. No matter the things that are happening around us, no matter the things that are happening in this country, may you always continue to stand on the rock of ages. Thank you and good morning for being here with us this morning. I am so grateful to see your beautiful faces. And uh, those of you who are watching at home, thank you so much for giving us your time. And I pray that um, all of us, we are opening our heart to what the gospel, the word of God, will be able to accomplish in our lives this morning. Um, <clears throat> it is our custom here, if you are a visitor, and, and I did notice we have a, a couple, we want to thank you guys so much for, for being part of our service this morning. Uh, it is our custom here to stand as we read uh, the word of God, to show reverence uh, to the word of God. So our reading of God's word is coming from John chapter 18, verse number 28 through 38. John chapter 18, verse number 28 through 38. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the, pa to the palace of the Roman governor. By now, it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now, my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus responded, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and honored to be in this building, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. And Father, I'm so grateful for those who are at home watching right now. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. And Father, I am so grateful for the freedom we have to worship you in this country. And Father, I pray that us believers in the faith, we will continue to stand up for your word. We will continue to stand up for the gospel. Father, I ask that your word will continue to guide our lives our thoughts, our views, our ways of life. And I pray, Father, the word that you have to speak to us this morning will resonate in our lives and help us to live better lives as brothers and sisters in Christ. We love you, and we pray in your son Jesus' name, and let the church say amen. Please have a seat. So this morning, we are going to continue with our sermon series that we started about four weeks ago. We've been talking about why and who killed Jesus. So far, we've explored different events and people who were implicated in the death of Christ. We've talked about the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, such as Caiaphas, the high priest. We talked about Jesus Christ going into Jerusalem, that passage of scripture that is famously known as the triumphal entry. We talked about how Jesus Christ, for the longest time during his ministry, he did not want people to really know his identity. Several times he healed folks, he would tell them, do not say a thing. But the moment he stepped foot, well, 
he was on a donkey the moment he got into Jerusalem. He wanted everyone to know because Jesus knew what was coming. He knew he was going to get killed. We talked about the fraudulent uh, Jewish trial that was conducted in the house of Caiaphas. How they brought up false charges and evidences, false witnesses. Just because they were looking to execute this man. There were a lot of different people and a lot of different things that happened that led to the death, the murder of Jesus Christ. And today, we are going to focus our attention on Pilate. But first, I must remind you guys, just so we have a, a clear understanding of where we were and where we are going. As I mentioned, we've talked about the Jewish trial. And you can read about that in John chapter 8, 13 through 27. The Jewish trial was conducted by the high priest Caiaphas in his house and the Sanhedrin council, they were there. The Sanhedrin council is comprised of Pharisees and Sadducees and the priests. There were at least 70 of them. And they decided that Jesus needed to be killed. And we've talked about all those different things that led to them making that decision, especially when they asked Jesus, are you the son of God? And Jesus basically said, yes, I am. And now we are going to focus on the Roman trial. Jesus, Jesus Christ went through a trial by the Jews, and now he's about to go through another trial by the Roman people, led by Pilate. And in that trial, of course, Pilate, was basically the one responsible, and King Herod was also involved very briefly. We're going to talk about that. And in John chapter 19, they pronounced the verdict. What was the verdict? Crucify him. That was the verdict. Now, just so I can set your mind, just so you guys can have the right mindset to understand uh, 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 what's going on in that trial, I don't want you to think that trial was conducted in a courtroom like we would imagine here in America. But it was a trial. The trial happened as after G Jesus Christ was condemned to death by the Jewish leaders, they took him to Pilate's house, the, pa the palace, the proterium, as some version would call it. Now, because it was Passover, the Jewish leaders did not want to enter the palace so that they would not be considered unclean because they wanted to just kill this man and go home and eat the Passover and celebrate and worship God as if they did not just kill the Son of God. So the, Jesus was brought inside the palace, and basically, if you read John 18 and 19, you will see there's a back and forth between Pal, uh, Pilate going inside talking to Jesus, going outside talking to, uh, to the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people who were present. And as the trial proceeded, I want you to imagine this. Governor Pilate, he basically served as the judge. And the Jewish leaders, they were the prosecutor. They were the one bringing up charges against Jesus Christ. They were the one asking for Jesus to be killed. And the Jewish people who, were, who was present, they basically served as the jury. They were the one who gave the verdict, crucify him. Once they heard all those complaints, all those false accusations brought up by the, the prosecutor, which were the Jewish leaders, they agreed this man need to be crucified. And of course, you have Jesus Christ, the accused, standing there without any defense. And to make matters, to, to help you understand better, a lot of questions they were asking Jesus, he refused to respond. Because everyone knows it was false accusation. There's only one time Jesus Christ responded. It's when they asked him, are you the son of God? And he had to stand up for that reason. He had to agree and admit and, and, and unequivocally say to the people, yes, I am. Although he knew exactly what was going to happen. Jesus knew he was about to get murdered. Now, there are two, like, we have four accounts of the gospel. You know, side note, I remember when I was in college and I had a college professor, and he taught the gospel. 
In the very first class, you know, he asked, how many Gospels are there? And we sat here, and, you know, some of us were preachers, and some of us were youth ministers, and we're like, is that a trick question? And we said, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he was like, all of you are wrong. There's one Gospel. There are four accounts of the Gospel. And for us to have a full picture of the gospel, of the teachings, the life, and the death of Jesus Christ, you need to read all four of them so that you can fully understand what happened. For example, I want to show you the difference. When you look at the Roman trial, according to the, uh, according to the gospel, according to John, we will see that Pilate, who's the judge, he asked for the charges brought up against Jesus. He said, what are the accusations? Where are the evidences? What exactly do you have against this man? And what was their response? Well, if we brought him to you, he must be a criminal. I want you to think about that. In this country, you are innocent until proven guilty. They already determined he is guilty without even examining the evidences, right? If we bring him to you, he must be guilty. So basically, the Jewish leader says he is guilty. Without presenting any evidence, they already declared him guilty. Why did they bring him, bring Jesus to Pilate? Now, that is if you are reading John. If you are reading the gospel according to John, that's what you will understand based on what is written in that chapter. But if you read the Roman trial according to Luke, Luke will tell you what some of these charges were. The Jewish leaders presented uh, those charges to Pilate in Luke chapter 23, verse number 2. They said, this man, we found this fellow to be guilty of perverting the nation. He's coming here, perverting our way of life, teaching things that goes against to the law, against the law. And we found this man forbidding the people to pay taxes to Caesar, which was a lie. Because Jesus Christ said what? Render unto Caesar what is to Caesar and to God what is unto God. Jesus never said, don't pay taxes to Caesar. And last but not least, they said, we found this man claiming to be Christ. But you need to understand, that's a religious crime. But the political crime is when Jesus said, he's the king. And they said to Pilate, he claiming to be the king. And later in the story, we're going to see that they told Pilate, we only have one king. And that's Caesar. Now, Pilate had to take action. But based on that last piece of evidence, they said that Jesus claimed to be Christ. And he said, yes, I am the Christ. These are men, as I mentioned before, these are religious leaders who've been studying the law their entire life. They know it backwards. They know the messianic prophecies. They know everything the Old Testament say about Jesus. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 7, the Bible says they were confused about the identity of Christ. Some say, isn't the Messiah supposed to come from Galilee? Others said, isn't the Messiah uh, supposed to be born in Bethlehem? But Jesus was known as Jesus of Nazareth because he grew up in Nazareth. But Jesus was born where? In Bethlehem. That is a prophecy you found in Micah chapter 5. When Jesus came on a donkey into Jerusalem, that is a prophecy you find in Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. Jesus Christ fulfilled every single prophecy. And if you are reading the gospel according to John, several times in the book of John, you will see that those words, this happened so that it must be fulfilled what was written in the prophet. Jesus Christ fulfilled all of them. But when Jesus Christ claimed to be the Christ, In John chapter 19, verse number 7, the Jewish leader says, we have a law according to Jewish uh, customs, according to our law. He needs to be killed. What was that law? Well, that law is found in Leviticus chapter 24, verse number 16. According to the Mosaic law in Leviticus 24, if someone blasphemed the name of God, If someone were to curse the name of God, that person need to be killed. To be more specific, stoned to death. That was the law. So they used that law against Christ to say he deserves death. Because he claimed to be Christ. Therefore, he's blaspheming the name of Christ. And we all know that was wrong. Because Jesus is indeed the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the living God. 
So Jesus' trial was both political and religious. Jesus, the Jews, they were forcing Pilate to use his power, his political power, to facilitate their Jewish authority and kill Jesus. You guys understand that? They did not have the right to kill Jesus. And we're going to talk about that, why that happened. Therefore, according to the Jewish trial led inside of Caiaphas' house, they decided he needs to die, but they couldn't do it. So they led him to Pilate. Pilate had the legal authority to kill Jesus, and they wanted Pilate to use his legal and political authority to approve of their religious authority. I want you to understand who Pilate was. Who was Governor Pontius Pilate? Before we can talk about Governor Pontius Pilate, we're going to go back briefly and talk about history. Judea was under Roman occupation. And the Roman people, they oppressed the people in Judea. And Judea was invaded, conquered, and besieged by General Pompey. These are historical facts. You don't need to read the Bible to know these facts. That was around year 63 B.C. So that is when, after General Pompey invaded, conquered, and besieged Jerusalem, the Roman Empire took over, and therefore they decided that they were going to bring some political change and establish a new government. That's when they decided we are going to put a governor in charge of Judea. Pilate became the fifth governor of Judea, and he reigned in Judea for about nine to ten years during the year of 26 to 37 A.D. Pilate was a ruthless governor. Now, if you read the trial of Jesus Christ, you will think that Pilate was a good guy. Pilate was trying to let Jesus go. And yes, he was, and we're going to see this te- uh, these verses. However, according to history, especially the writings of Jose- Josephus, Josephus was a historian. He was born in Jerusalem around the year 36, 37 AD. Josephus lived during the time of the first century church, the first century Christians. He kept very good record of the history of the Jews. So that's why I don't mind talking about him. According to Josephus, the Bible says, I mean, not the Bible, I'm sorry. History will tell you that Rome allowed Pilate to use Roman military to help maintain order in Judea. That was his primary job, maintaining order in Judea. As a prefect, that was his job. Some version will say proconsul. And also, you need to understand, as a governor, he was the head of the judicial system, the newly established judicial system by the Roman Empire, And it was also his responsibility to collect tributes and taxes for the Roman Empire. That was his job. Everything goes through Pilate. Pilate did not have a good reputation among the Jewish people. Historians such as Philo and Josephus would tell you how ruthless and insensitive Pilate was towards the Jews. But before we examine some um, outside evidences, you can read for yourself in Luke chapter 13, And verse number one, that's a biblical evidence showing you that Pilate was a ruthless governor. Pilate, in Luke chapter 13, the Bible says that he would mix the blood of some Galileans who were going to worship with the blood of their sacrifices. He killed them. That's how ruthless he was, according to the Bible. But also, in history, you can read how Josephus himself, he said there was an incident when demonstration broke out. Now, you need to understand, when Rome invaded the place, Rome was considered to be the center of modern-day civilization. They would build roads. They would bring aqueducts so that water could flow into the city. So Pilate wanted to build an aqueduct into Jerusalem. But instead of using taxes and tributes paid to the Roman Empire, he went into the, uh, into the temple and took tre- money from the treasure, money from the people to build that aqueduct. Therefore, the Jewish people revolted. They were upset. That's our money. We're already paying a lot of money to the Roman Empire. So they were upset about that. And as a result, Pilate sent soldiers 
among the protesters. And every time somebody started to protest, the soldier who's dressed as a civilian killed that person on the spot. Eventually, the crowd scattered. That's how ruthless Pilate was. This happened several times. Pilate was also so insensitive to Jewish history and Jewish culture. According to Josephus, the Bible says Pilate would bring, uh, uh, he would secretly bring into Jerusalem army standards bearing the images of Roman emperors and idols, which was considered really bad in the Jewish eye, intentionally, just so he would provoke the Jewish people. That's how insensitive he was. Imagine a Jew waking up and find a Nazi flag in front of his house. That's this idea that's going on here. That's insensitive. That is wrong. And Pilate was willingly doing that to provoke the Jews. And Pilate really didn't care. And it was that Pilate, now that you have a picture of how ruthless and insensitive he was to the Jews, it was that Pilate who declared Jesus innocent of all charges. Now, I want you to understand, Pilate was bad. Pilate was ruthlessly governing the Jews. And here is Jesus who is innocent. Pilate found Jesus innocent. Why? It's because Jesus was really innocent. You guys get that? Pilate said, he's innocent. As a matter of fact, not only once, twice, but three times in the gospel, Pilate declared Jesus innocent. Look at Luke chapter 23. I want to read all three verses. Verse number four. So Pilate said to the chief priests, I found no fault, no charges against this man. Verse number 14. After they kept on arguing and making their cases, in verse number 14, Pilate said again, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed, having examined him in your presence... I have found no fault and no charges against this man, against those things of which you accused him of. Verse number 22, Pilate said, why, what evil has he done? I found no reason for death in Jesus. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. That was Pilate's decision. Now you need to ask yourself, why did Pilate agree to crucify Jesus Christ? Because he examined the evidences. He saw the man standing in his courtroom. Not literally. And he looked at the charges. He heard the people. And him being the judge said, all these charges are false. This man does not deserve to die. Pilate, the ruthless governor who killed Jews, was insensitive towards Jewish history. That Pilate said Jesus is innocent of all charges. When he heard that Jesus was from Galilee, the Bible says that Pilate sent Jesus to Herod because Pilate didn't want to have anything to do with it. So when they brought Jesus to King Herod, who was in town, King Herod was excited to see Jesus because King Herod have been, he has heard about Jesus Christ. He has heard of the miracles. He has heard of the great things Jesus has done. So he wanted to see for himself. So he asked Jesus to perform a sign or a miracle, and Jesus would not have it. Jesus was not some type of puppet for you to just play with. So King Herod got mad, put a robe on him, beat him up, mocked him, and sent him back to Pilate. That's what the Bible says in Luke chapter 23, verse number 6 and 7. As a matter of fact, if you read verse number 15, listen to what Pilate says. Neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. Even King Herod did not think Jesus was guilty. I want you to think about that. Pilate, the ruthless governor, King Herod, who did not really have a good relationship with the Jews, both Roman political leaders found Jesus innocent. Why did they agree to crucify him? Why? Both Pilate and King Herod, they, asked, uh, they agreed Jesus did nothing deserving of death. They both were in agreement. So why 
did they still crucify Jesus Christ? Now, I want you to understand, as governor, Pilate, he had the legal authority to reject the false charges brought up against Jesus. That was within his purview. He had that authority. Let me prove that to you. In Acts chapter 18, there is a story of Paul leaving uh, for a Corinth. When Paul got to the uh, Corinth, Paul met with Aquila and Priscilla. And at that time, the emperor Claudius had expelled the Jews from Rome. And that's why Paul met with Aquila and Priscilla. They all were tent makers. They started working together. They started preaching in the synagogue on Sabbath day. And the Jews refused to listen. So Paul says, your blood is in your hand. I'm going to go to some folks who's going to listen to me, like the Gentiles. So Paul was in Achaia, started to preach to the Gentiles. Here comes the Jews. They revolted. So they took Paul and brought him to the, Roman, uh, the governor at that time, Galileo. Well, I'm sorry, Galileo. Galileo was this Italian. You, you guys know Galileo. Galileo, that was, a, that was the governor of that time. So the governor, as they were presenting evidences against Paul, it's within his right. So he said, none of you right. I'm going to let him go. So they let, he let Paul go. Pilate could have done the same thing, but Pilate didn't. Why do you think that was? I really want you to ponder on that question before I answer it. In John chapter 19, where do you come from, Pilate asked Jesus. Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate said, do you refuse to speak to me? You need to understand, Pilate is a judge. If I ask a question in my courtroom as a judge, you need to respond. Pilate said, where you come from? And Jesus says nothing. Oh, you ain't talking to me. Now, Pilate had to remind Jesus of his power. Pilate said, you do know that I have the right to either release you or kill you. I want you to listen to what Jesus said. Oh, in my head, I think Jesus is mad. Because Jesus said, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, you have no such power. Whatever power you think you have, God give it to you. God is allowing me to get killed. Not you. I'm giving my life for this. Pilate thought he was in charge, but God was in charge. Do you see that? Brothers and sisters, I believe even through our darkest moments, God is still in control. We may not understand it, but Jesus did. God was in control then. God could have easily, as the song said, sent 10,000 angels to rescue Jesus. He didn't, but he was still in control. He gave that power to Pilate. He gave him the authority to kill Jesus. It wasn't Pilate. But God allowed it to happen. Just because God is not acting as we want him to, don't ever think that God stops being in control. Pilate knew the Jewish leaders had no legal authority over Jesus' life. He knew they could not kill him without Pilate's approval. Because in the text, in John chapter 18, Pilate, after he left Jesus Christ inside, he went outside. He says, what accusation have you against this man? They said, if you were not a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you, Pilate. Pilate said, you take him then. Judge him according to your law. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Pilate knew they had no legal authority. They could not kill Jesus on their own. And Pilate knew Jesus did nothing deserving of death. So why did he go through with it? Here's what I'd like to share with you. Pilate was afraid of an uprising among the people. Pilate was afraid of an uprising among the Jewish people. Now, you need to understand, he could have dismissed the false charges, but an uprising wouldn't serve the interest of the Roman Empire. At that time, it was Passover. According to history, there were about 80 to 100,000 Jews living in Jerusalem. And during Passover, Jewish people from all over the world would come into that town. Can you imagine an up, a Jewish uprising during Passover? They didn't have enough soldiers to hold them back. Pilate knew that was bad. That was a bad, that would have been a bad political move. 
He understood that. And I'm going to show that to you. Pilate's primary job was to uphold Pax Romana. Remember, Pax Romana means Roman peace. And if a Jewish people, they were to have an uprising during Passover, it would compromise that. And Pilate's leadership would be compromised. Pilate was afraid of an uprising. In Matthew chapter 27, the Bible says, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, regardless of everything he said, Pilate said, these people, they're listening to me. Pilate was afraid of an uprising starting among the Jews. It's right here in the text. So Pilate took water and washed his hands as if he's not guilty. I know this is sim a symbolic of what he wanted to say. I'm not guilty of this. Yes, you are, Pilate, because you have the legal authority to stop everything from happening. But yet, because you're afraid of a Jewish uprising, you decided to hand Jesus over to get killed. Unfortunately, Pilate could not ignore the voices of the people asking for Jesus to get killed. There were too many of them. During Passover, he could not ignore them. And in Luke chapter 23, the Bible says, I will punish him and release him. Pilate tried to get a, find a way out of it. Pilate said, let me just beat him up and let him go. They're like, no, 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 Pilate. The whole crowd shouted, away with this man. Release Barabbas. And we talked about that before. Give us the criminal. Let, uh, you need to crucify this innocent man. That is Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 15, verse number 15, you see right here? The Bible says Pilate acted in that way because he wanted to satisfy the crowd in order to avoid a Jewish uprising. If he did not give into the demands of the crowd, there would be an uprising. And that is not good news for the Roman Empire. But also, I believe Pilate was afraid. He was afraid of the Roman Empire. He was afraid of what Caesar would have done to him. He was afraid if he did not handle this situation the proper way, he could have lost his job. He could have been in trouble. Pilate was afraid. And you can see it in John chapter 19. The text says Pilate was afraid. Because he knew what could happen if he did not deal with the situation properly. Forget that he is innocent. What about my job? Forget that he's innocent. What about my life? He did not do the right thing because he was afraid how the Jewish people would react and how the Roman Empire would react. Pilate was afraid. In John 19, verse number 12, from then on, listen to this, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let him go, listen to this, you are no friend of Caesar. Whew. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Do you guys understand what happened to anyone who opposes Caesar? Do you guys understand what happened to anyone who is considered an enemy of the state? If you let him go, you are no friend of Caesar. Worst case, I mean, best case scenario, Pilate loses his job. Worst case scenario, which is highly likely, Pilate would have lost his life. That's the background of the story that we don't often think about. They said, Pilate, you know you can't let him go, because if you do, you are no friend of Caesar. We are going to protest. There's going to be riot. Caesar's going to hear about it, and you're going to be in trouble because you are in charge. So give the people what they want, which is this man, this innocent man on the cross, and everything will be back to normal. Pilate was afraid. Governor Pontius Pilate, he serves at the pleasure of the Roman emperor to preserve and protect Roman interests in Judea. And having Jewish people uprising, having a Jewish man claiming to be a king, that does not serve Roman interest. That is the reason why when Pilate said, you want me to kill your king? They said, uh-uh, he's not our king. We have one king, and his name is Caesar. And I believe it was Tiberius Caesar at that time. John 19, 15. 
So eventually, Pilate capitulated to the voices of the people, and his feeble attempts to let Jesus go failed. Pilate gave in to the demands of the people, regardless of the evidences, regardless how he felt, and he knew Jesus was innocent. He gave in to his demands. But now, I want you to consider one last question before we put an end to this. Why did the people want Jesus killed? We're talking about the Jewish people here. Why did they want Jesus killed? Just think about it. The Jewish people. It was a whole crowd who led Jesus to Pilate. Luke 23, verse number 1. It was a multitude of people that chose Barabbas instead of Christ. It was a multitude of people shouting to Pilate, crucify Jesus. Why? Because without the voices of the people, the religious leaders attempt to crucify Christ, it would have lost traction. The Sanhedrin council by themselves would not have been able to convince Pilate to crucify Jesus. They needed the people. And that's why the text says they stirred up the whole crowd to scream, crucify Jesus. Why do you think the Jewish people wanted to crucify Jesus? I believe, such as, look at Luke 23, verse number 23. The Bible says, they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and the chief priests prevailed. That's why they prevailed, because the people were all there crying, crucify Jesus Christ. These are the Jewish people who Jesus Christ did not consider as his enemies. And when you really think about it, they stymied the Jewish leaders' previous attempt to destroy Jesus in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, to, to destroy Jesus in the temple. I'm sorry, it says people, it should have said temple. You remember when Jesus was in the temple helping folks, the chief priest wanted to kill Jesus then. But the people stopped him from, stopped them from killing Jesus, from arresting Jesus. Look at Luke chapter 19, verse number 47 and 48. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet, they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung to his words. So what happened? What happened to protecting Jesus from the temple to cry and crucify him in front of Pilate? What happened to saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, when Jesus walked into Jerusalem to cry and crucify him in front of Pilate? What happened? Because these are the people Jesus Christ healed. These are the people Jesus Christ fed. These are the people Jesus Christ cast demons out of. These are the people he forgave. These are the people he ate with many of them. What in the world happened? So what happened with what seemed to be a sudden shift in allegiance against Jesus Christ? That's what what it seemed to me. Why? The Jewish people, there are some who believe it was the Jewish mob. Some version of the Bible would even say that. Some theologians would say, Uh, The crowd did not really represent the Jewish people. It was a mob. No, it wasn't. Because when you read scripture, Peter himself said in Acts chapter 3, verse 12 and 15, and Acts chapter 2, he says, You Jews, with the help of wicked men, killed Jesus. It wasn't the mob. Peter said, You Jews killed him. Why? Why? Well, let me, let me ask you to consider this. I think there's a connection. It's the same reason why Peter and Judas, Peter, uh, uh, um, betrayed Je- Peter denied Jesus and Judas betrayed Jesus. Why do you think they did that? In the presence of those seeking to kill Jesus, Peter denied the Lord. Why didn't he stand his ground? He was scared. What about Judas who betrayed Jesus? The Bible says he sold him out for some money. And I'd like to talk about Jesus on a whole other lesson by itself because he's a character in the Bible that intrigues me. You followed Jesus this entire time and you betrayed him? It makes me feel like 
any good friend of mine could, you know, can betray me. Why? There are texts in the Bible that says Jesus, uh, Judas, he was the treasure for, for the group of people, for the disciples, right? And the Bible says he would often steal money from the treasure, from the money bag. And I think there's a connection when the Bible says Satan entered Judas, Satan knew Judas' weakness was money. He used to steal money from the money bag he was responsible for. Just think about it. And Satan, using the leaders, offered Judas money to betray Jesus. We'll talk about that another time. But the whole thing is that the Jewish people, they denied the Lord of glory in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. They denied Jesus. We are all guilty and have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. And I believe had the Jewish people not been guilty, they would not have something to repent of. And that is why in Acts chapter 2, Paul says, uh, Peter said, you are guilty of the death of Christ. And later they said, yes, we know we are guilty. What shall we do to be saved? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I said all this to say one thing. The religious leaders, Pilate, and the Jewish people, they represent a microcosm of humanity who are all guilty of the, great, of the death of Jesus. What am I saying? Every single one of us is guilty. A lot of times when we read scripture, we talk about how ruthless Pilate was. We talk about how ruthless King Herod was. We talk about how could those chief priests betray Jesus? How could they lead him to Pilate and crucify him? All these things, I just want you to consider one thing. You are Pilate. I am Pilate. You are Barabbas. I am Barabbas. You are those chief priests. So am I. It should have been us. When we read the story, we can feel indignant. We can feel however we want to feel about Pilate. However we want to feel about Caiaphas and Judas. I would never betray Jesus. That's the same thing Peter said. Lord, wherever you go, I will follow you. But when he was facing the actual crisis where his life was at stake, I don't know that man. Three times he denied Jesus. The Bible says Peter started to curse. I don't know if it was cussing or cursing, but he said a few things that the Bible writer could not write in Scripture. So yes, they were responsible, and so are we. You know why? Because Pete, Jesus would not have to die if we didn't sin. So we are responsible. So what am I saying? When Jesus died, as he was on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. That forgiveness is not only for the people who killed them. That forgiveness is extended to everyone else in this world who is willing to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That is what I'm saying. And this morning, if you understand how guilty you are, as Paul explained in Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you understand how sinful you are and you understand that you are responsible and you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, my, my response to you will be this, Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said in Mark, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Salvation is yours. You only have to accept Jesus through repentance confession, and baptism. Let's all stand and sing together.